how do you uh feel about people who say you started your own uh mob or your own BDs, you know, after 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 everything that happened with uh King Shorty because uh King Shorty uh had sex with your wife or your girlfriend. Okay, what are you talking about um Colin? Look, look, this is what happened. We got law. That incident happened. I told him he broke law. Because see, back then the same thing that I witnessed, disciples messing with disciple women's wives and it was disrespect. We fought each other about that. So as I was writing the law, I was writing the law so we wouldn't make them mistakes no more. After a period of solid peace between GDs and BDs from late 1978 to late 1979, a flare-up occurred in Statesville, which was eventually resolved. However, tensions flared up again in late 1980 and escalated on January 29, 1981, when black disciples became aggressive with gangsters at Statesville. We fell out because Smokey wanted everybody to become black gangster disciples. I kept telling him, no, we from the house of David. You know how this go. You know what I'm saying? And I wouldn't go. And that's why me and Don Smokey really fell out. You did same way with uh, uh, um, Crusher. You did Gregory Knox. Same way with a few other older guys. I wasn't playing them games, man. Statesville Prisons Unit B. Tensions between the Black Disciples and the Gangster's Disciples boiled over when Black Disciple member George Bailey refused to relinquish his privileged duty as a cell house helper, a position that allowed inmates to move around without cuffs or guards. Gangster Disciple leader Ernest Smokey Wilson demanded that all Black Disciples either re-sign from the position or switch allegiance to the Gangsters. After two BDs resigned and one, Bailey, refused to comply. BDs began chanting BD power every night for two weeks in protest. Wilson then picked a fight with Bailey and was subsequently placed in segregation. Upon his return to the unit on January 29th, Wilson plotted with fellow GDs to kill Bailey, and Fred Bobo Collins struck him repeatedly in the head with an aluminum bat, leading to Bailey's hospitalization and eventual death on February 5, 1981, according to court documents. Mickey taught the BDs the new hand sign, which was the gates or the three fingers. This was the new hand sign. Mickey Johnson made sure not all of the Stateway Gardens became GD, and even convinced most of the Dell Vikings to flip to BDs, making the BDs have a strong presence in the Stateway Gardens. This is the story of how BDs got into the Stateway Gardens in 1981. I feel like, wait, what happened where well, you couldn't keep the grip on the black disciples pushing what he wanted to be pushed. When, like, how did you lose when, control? When, how did you lose control? When, 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 when I crowned Shorty, like I said, and all the difficulties started, you see, it was people that liked him, that followed him as a king. You see, and I still had everybody that was loyal and obligated to me from the day I put this thing back together that knew about it. And them the peoples that followed me. A lot of people was mad at me, you dig, because I told them, stay with him, you dig. But what? Because I wanted them to see for themselves what type of person he was and for them to make up their mind. And if they wanted to come on, you did come on. But I wanted them to see. And when things started happening to them, and this man started doing stuff to them the same way and taking money from them, in 1982, the wars between GDs and BDs almost came to an end after Don. Dirk Acklin was released from prison and disapproved of how powerful Jerome Shorty Freeman had become. Dirk then created his own group of black disciples to go against Freeman's called the Apostles and a civil war began within the BDs. As a result of this war, relations between GDs and BDs smoothed over as these two BD factions were focused on removing each other until Dirk Acklin's bus went back to the rest of the BDs in 1983 or 1984. In the year 1984, Mickey Bull was promoted again to the rank of minister, which gave him his own dynasty. Being a minister was a very high rank that usually no one receives in the organization. 
Having a dynasty means you control an entire area of the city. Mickey's dynasty was the entire south side of Chicago. Anywhere from Bronzeville down to the wild 100s was controlled by Mickey. His main territory that he directly supervised daily was the Robert Taylor Homes. He held BD meetings in front of the 4,950 building. Bull himself stayed at the 5,041 S Federal Street in apartment 1505 with Brenda Weir. He ran that building and all the buildings around. 1980s relations between BDs and GDs was at its best point, especially now that folk nation rules and regulations reached the streets. Now both gangs would often team up against rivals like Vice Lords, Black P. Stones, and Mickey Cobras. The crack cocaine epidemic of the late 1980s caused relations between the two gangs to completely break down, mainly because of the crack trade in the Inglewood neighborhood. Beginning in the year 1987, fierce competition and intense gang wars erupted in the high-rise public housing projects citywide. Gangs began muscling in on these buildings and began setting up their own security as they walked through the hallways armed with automatic weapons and shotguns as they patted down residents and imposed curfews. The competition was fierce. They even controlled the elevators in the projects and would jump down the shafts and hitch rides up and down. Inglewood neighborhood is Chicago's most violent and most impoverished neighborhood, and just like the high-rise housing projects, the Inglewood community became a hotbed for crack cocaine users, which made distribution a large money-making commodity. The BDs had a long-rooted history in the Inglewood community as the largest piece of their story started on these streets, and they felt ownership of this neighborhood. Black P. Stones and Mickey Cobras were never welcomed by BDs in this neighborhood, but now the BDs' biggest allies, the gangster disciples, were muscling in on too many BD drug spots because GDs felt they were entitled due to being the larger organization and sitting at the top of the Folk Nation Alliance. BDs felt disrespected from their GD brethren. By 1989, the tempers began to flare. Jerome Shirty Freeman ended up back in prison with a 28-year sentence for felony drug charges in 1989, and soon after all hell was about to break loose on the streets of Englewood. This was the beginning of severe conflict between BDs and GDs. In the scorching summer of 1991, tensions were high between the gangster disciples and black disciples. Some GDs were eager to engage in a full-fledged war with the BDs. But Mickey Bull, a prominent figure in the BD organization, was working hard to maintain a peaceful relationship between the two groups. However, his efforts to control the GDs were seen as a threat to some members who did not want to be controlled. Despite being untouchable and respected by many BDs and GDs alike, Mickey Bull was not prepared for an attack from the GDs. He was mild-mannered and charming but also had a reputation for having no tolerance for those who crossed him. Whenever he walked the streets, he had a distinctive whistle that the BDs recognized as a summons for business. It did not matter what you were doing at the time. You had to drop everything and answer his call. This gave him immense power, and his enemies could not touch him because he was always aware of their movements. However, in August of 1991, Mickey Bull was caught off guard when members of the GDs assassinated him on the street. This act sparked an immediate and violent response from the BDs, who were determined to avenge their fallen leader. On August 7th, the neighborhood of Englewood became a war zone as the BDs sought out retribution for Mickey Bull's death. During the sweltering summer of 1991 in Chicago, Tensions between the gangster disciples and black disciples reached a new level following the death of Mickey Bull. On August 7th of that year, the BDs committed a cold-blooded murder of three GD members from inside a taxi cab, which was a highly unusual and unexpected method for a gang hit. The incident began earlier that day at 66th and Peoria, near the apartments at 6,556 S. Peoria, which have since been torn down. When a BD member named Tojo taunted three GD members by throwing up the BD gang sign, one of the GDs, Kevin Gibbs, responded with the GD gang sign and shouted BDK, to which Tojo replied with GDK, 
Someone from inside the apartment building then shot at Tojo, who quickly drove away but warned he would return later. Later that night, around 11 o'clock p.m., the gangster's disciples were back at the corner selling drugs when a red and white taxi pulled up, followed by a red LeBaron. Both vehicles stopped, and a gun appeared from the window of the taxi, opening fire on the GDs. All three GD members were shot, with two surviving and one dying from the attack. Shortly after, at 618 West 71st Street in front of a submarine sandwich shop 71st and Low, now a vacant lot, another shooting occurred, resulting in three more GD members being shot, two of whom died at the scene. It was later discovered that the taxi used in the first shooting was stolen, possibly as a diversion tactic, as it was unlikely for anyone to expect a taxi to suddenly start shooting at them. During the years between 1991 and 1994, the south side of Chicago was embroiled in a violent war between the gangster disciples and black disciples. Members of both gangs claimed that it was nearly impossible to go anywhere without risking violence or retaliation. However, in 1994, a temporary peace was brokered between the two gangs after Marvell Thompson, who had been cleared of a murder charge, intervened. This intervention helped to quell the violence for a brief period of time. Unfortunately, this peace did not last long and the war between the GDs and BDs became permanent in 1994. The violence continued to escalate, leading to numerous deaths and injuries on both sides. Until this day, 1990s progressed. There was a growing trend of gangster disciple gang members defecting to the Black Disciples. This was due in part to the fact that certain BD drug factions offered lower taxis and rub profits than the GDs, making it more attractive for members to switch sides. This flipping of gang members was not only a financial decision, but also reflected growing animosity between the two gangs. The GDs and BDs were bitter rivals with a long history of violence and territorial disputes. Members who switched sides were often targeted by their former gang, leading to even more violence and bloodshed. The conflict between the GDs and BDs continued throughout the 1990s and into the 2000s, with both gangs engaging in brutal acts of violence and drug-related crime. Despite efforts by law enforcement and community organizations to curb gang activity, the rivalry between these two gangs remains a significant issue in many Chicago neighborhoods to this day. In the mid-1990s, the Black Disciples Gang experienced an influx of new members who were attracted by the lower taxis on rug profits that the gang offered. Among these new recruits was an 11-year-old boy named Robert Sandifer, who was known as Yummy to his fellow gang members. Yummy had a history of criminal behavior that began when he was just 8 years old and had escalated to stealing cars and breaking into houses. In August of 1994, the Black Disciples ordered Yummy to kill some rival gangsters' disciple members. Yummy fired a 9mm pistol into a group of kids and accidentally killed 14-year-old Shavon Dean. The murder caused public outrage and put a spotlight on the Black Disciples. The gang was worried that Yummy, being so young, would cooperate with the police if he was caught, so they ordered his own brothers to kill him. Yumi's 14- and 16-year-old brothers lured him to a viaduct underpass, made him kneel, and then shot him twice in the back of the head. The two brothers were convicted of Yumi's murder, and the incident brought a lot of attention to the Black Disciples and their activities, despite efforts by their leaders to keep it quiet. It's worth noting that there is some controversy and debate over the specifics of Chuck Dorsey's death and the events that followed. While it is true that he was shot and killed in January 1996, some sources suggest that the meeting between the GDs and BDs that followed was not a peaceful one and that violence did occur. Additionally, there are conflicting reports about whether or not Rimrod was killed shortly after the meeting, as some sources suggest he was killed several months later in May 1996. Regardless, it is clear that the death of Chuck Dorsey was a significant event in the ongoing conflict between the GDs and BDs, and that it had an impact on the gang dynamics in various parts of Chicago. 
deputies grew incredibly in the 1990s and 2000s decade as they climbed up to becoming one of the top 10 largest gangs in Chicagoland with members in other states and scattered all over the suburbs. Violent gang wars erupted in the Robert Taylor and Stateway Gardens projects as gunfire echoed day and night mainly between BDs and GDs. Both gangs exercise majority control of both public housing high-rise complexes and other gangs had a very small piece of these buildings. Therefore, the BDs and GDs were each other's biggest competition in these projects. The BDs showed their muscle against the larger enemy and showed relentless pursuit of violence against their foes, which gained them a massive reputation causing many starry-eyes young black youths to want to join the gang as they grew to over 6,000 members. When, when I was uh, 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 gained the title Minister of Defense, at the time that the Don became the Don of Don and Shorty Freeman became the king of the nation, you did, I went on to establish that Calumet building as such. The brother Scan. He was 14 years old when I allowed him in the nation, and he grew to be very powerful. In 1991, the Black Disciples took over the 16-story high-rise Randolph Tower Housing Authority complex located in the Washington Park neighborhood, which was located at 6,217 S. Calumet Avenue, 63rd and Calumet. This large building the BDs nicknamed the castle, where they set up a complex $45,000 a day to as much as $300,000 a day crack cocaine and heroin operation in this tower. The tower was run by Marvel Thompson and residents and anyone were searched at the front door by armed BD guards with automatic weapons and shotguns. This operation was incredibly complex as money from drug profits was even laundered and invested into an Atlanta nightclub, apartment buildings, and even into the rap label MOB. Black Disciple snipers were posted on the roof of the buildings equipped with high-powered and complex sniper rifles while they wore night vision goggles at night so they could spot enemy gang members and pick them off. The building was not friendly to police officers, and Chicago police stayed away especially after one incident where an undercover officer entered the building, and as he was potted down a bulletproof vest was discovered. As he tried to run a BD pulled out his pistol and shot the officer in the back, but the officer survived. The BDs even became so bold that they hijacked the WCFL 104.7 radio frequency that was a frequency owned by a Christian radio station in the suburb of Morris. Once you arrived in Chicago city limits, the frequency was playing gangster rap music that was described by the Chicago Tribune article. The frequency owners were shocked when they drove to Midway Airport and the music suddenly took over. The frequency was also said to be used to communicate with the tower to alert the gang of any possible threats coming. In 2004, a massive raid by the police swept through this complex as several members were arrested. In the aftermath, it was decided the best way to stop the dealings at this complex was to tear the complex down, and in 2004, the buildings were razed. The tower was the largest drug operation the Black Disciples had ever ran, but the gang would continue to grow and open new ventures regardless. The Black Disciples have grown to over 6,000 members, and now the Black Disciples is more popular than ever because of rappers like Chief Keef and Lil Durk and the BD areas surrounding these rap artists.